Hello and a warm welcome to this week's Captains of Industry. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen. Joining me in the hot seat this evening, Clive Thompson, the CEO of Barlow World. Clive, it's always a, a pleasure to chat. I want to go back to 2006 when you took over as CEO of Barlow World. 2007, the group moved into a clear restructuring phase. How did you begin that operation? Did you take a look at the group as a whole and say, listen, we've got to batten down the hatches, we've got to refocus what we actually do here? Yes, Bronwyn, essentially that's what it was about. It was refocusing on our core businesses, which were our distribution businesses, which we had sort of been in with Caterpillar since 1927. And uh, over time, the, the group had become very diverse, become essentially an industrial conglomerate. And the feeling was strategically we needed to refocus on our core and uh, therefore we unbundled uh, Free World Co Coatings and, and PPC and sold off a couple of our international businesses and re really repositioned the group as a distributor of leading global brands. Did you have buy-in from management straight away having just gotten to the, the top job and then suddenly restructuring the group? Was there any pushback at that point? Look, there were a couple of decisions uh, that we said we would subject to strategic review. So uh, certain areas of our business, we didn't take a decision on, on day one. But by about May of, of 2007, we, we announced finally to the, to the market. And by that stage, I really interfaced with my executive team. And although I had my own views, uh, I think by the time we announced everything publicly, uh, my, ex my executive team was with me and, and we were all headed in the right direction. Do you think also you potentially had buy-in right from the beginning because you had been been part of the Barlow World story for such a long time, although in different positions. Yes, correct. And, uh, you know, there were a number of changes in, in, in people over that time, uh, particularly those divisions that, that we shared. But I think um, all the rest of the executives I'd worked with over an extensive period, and I think we had been through strategic planning processes, and, and we were pretty much on sides as to what needed to be done to reposition the group. How would you describe Barlow World today? It's, it's still a, a diverse industrial in the sense that we, we, we uh, um, operate in, in 27 countries around, around the world in, in a number of different industry segments. You know, we, we, we focused on mining, but also infrastructure, power systems, materials handling, agriculture, logistics. So, so Industrial conglomerate, does the description fit? I, 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 I wouldn't use the word conglomerate anymore because I think uh, although they are quite diverse businesses f focused on different industry sectors, they're all about distribution, essentially distributing new and used equipment and providing uh, product support solutions uh, for that equipment. And whether that's motor vehicles or Caterpillar equipment or high forklift trucks or Massey Ferguson tractors, the business model is fairly sim similar. And, and that's where I think the strategic logic uh, of, of the grouping hangs together. You mentioned that you are in 27 countries, five continents in terms of the Barlow world picture. And it follows that I'm going to use you as a barometer of what exactly is happening in the world at the moment. As we know, there's so much uncertainty and people actually don't know where we are going. So from what you're seeing on the ground, let's start geography by geography just to say, are you getting a holistic picture that things are going to be fine? Or are there certain territories that are in dire, dire straits? Yes, I, I think maybe if I tackle it geography by geography, because I think the picture is, is very different uh, depending on where in the world we are. And Which is great because you diversified and it balances means the risk. Barometer. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> balances the risk, exactly. And look, I think if I start off on the positive areas, um, uh, Southern Africa is going very well for us. Uh, you know, there's a lot of mining and infrastructure needs through the continent. And, uh, you know, I remember an uh, economist article a number of years back talking about Africa, the hopeless continent. And uh, now, that's changed to Africa, the, the land of opportunity. And, uh, and we're seeing that tangibly on the ground. I think the other area is, is Russia, another one of the sort of bricks um, where, where mining activity is strong, uh, oil and gas activity is strong, and infrastructure uh, activity is strong. I think the areas where we're seeing uh, the most weakness is in Europe. And, uh, well, that's no surprise. That's no surprise. It's, it's linked to the Eurozone crisis. And, uh, you know, we, we've got a, a presence in Spain, Portugal, Belgium, Holland, and, and, and the United Kingdom. And I think all of those we're seeing uh, sluggish growth at best. And, and you have for some time. I think I remember chatting to you about Spain a while yes. ago. And that's yeah. been pretty much a beleaguered territory for the group for a long period of time. Or is that unfair? I would say since things started slowing there in about April 2008, but came off a cliff uh, when the Lehman crisis uh, ensued just post September 2008. So this is about the fourth year, I would say, we've had pretty difficult conditions uh, in Spain. Yeah. So what happens now? How do you 
what remedial action do you take to make sure that you stay in that territory or do you even consider pulling out? Yeah. Look, we're not considering pulling out and the, and the reason for that is that uh, we distribute the Caterpillar brand there. We've had a relationship with Caterpillar since 1927. And I think what we realize, particularly in the industries we serve, is they are cyclical. I mean, the construction cycle, uh, as we know, goes through highs and lows, the mining cycle the same. And so you really have to take a long-term view on your business. You know, from about the mid-90s in Spain uh, till 2007, we had 14 years of uninterrupted growth. And at the peak, we were making a lot of money in Spain. Um, for all the reasons we know, both the, the infrastructure cycle and the residential construction cycle has, has collapsed in Spain and uh, you know the, the, the yellow metal industry has, has collapsed similarly so we're going through uh, through difficult times but it will turn I, I mean I can't give you absolute picture of when because Europe remains constrained but all you've really got to do in these times then is manage your business accordingly and, and there's been an unfortunate reality but we've had to take out about 50 percent of our headcount in Spain over the last four years to manage the cost base well let's bring it to home as you say construction is cyclical and so is mining, but I want to focus on the construction story for a moment in South Africa and potentially in Africa. Right now in South Africa, that construction story is hanging in the, in the balance. Margins are depressed. We see negative news flow on, on a couple of companies. And there's not much hope that we're going to see that cycle kicking up anytime soon. Of course, mm. there is the, the public sector spend that everybody's waiting to come online. Where do you see this cycle turning? Is it, is it on the horizon or are we still somewhere off? Look, it's a good question and, and uh, obviously in the lead up to 2010 with the, with the Soccer World Cup there was, a, there was a boom in activity and we benefited from that. But, but there's been a slump since that time and, and I think if you look at the construction companies, most of them are still pretty subdued in terms of the immediate prospects. But I think if you look to the medium term, South Africa needs infrastructure spend. Uh, the rail capacity, the port capacity, um, the road capacity, uh, we, we need more in order to lower the cost of doing business in the country uh, and, and move forward on a, on a stronger growth trajectory and, and create jobs. And I think the government is committed to it. Uh, and, and I think we will see it coming through on time. I mean, it, it's not well coming through, perhaps not as quickly as people would like. But, but I think in the medium term, infrastructure spend will rebound and, and we will be well placed to be a beneficiary of that when it happens. It obviously is a key feeder into the Barlow World story. You are intimately yes. linked to the construction space. Yes. In, in the Caterpillar business in Southern Africa, historically about 50% of our revenues have been infrastructure related and about 50% mining related. But over the recent uh, years, we've seen infrastructure spending come off and mining uh, expen expenditure increase. So at this point in time, it's skewed about 70-30 in favour of mining and away from infrastructure. Now let's look at the mining story in light uh, of those numbers. We've seen a number of platinum miners closing down their mines, considering the pressure that they are experiencing right now. It doesn't look as though we, we're seeing any positivity coming out of the likes of an Anglo-American, Kumba Iron Ore, etc. All of them are leading up to, to a bad news story at the moment. Is it a dismal picture, or do you think that this is just a temporary pullback and then we're going to see everything come back online? Yes. Look, it, it is relative, Bronwyn, because 2008, this, I mean, uh, 2012, this year, will be the, the highest number of mining unit deliveries we've made since the last record, which was in 2008. So we're coming off what for us is, a, is an all-time record, and, and I think the slowdown must be seen in that context. Uh, I think the other uh, important point I would make So you're is saying be aware of the base effect here? Yes. This time it's off a positive base, yeah. and that could basically exacerbate... The, the, the downtrend. It could exacerbate the downtrend, but but also bear in mind, you know, if you were seeing a downtrend off a, off a weak base, it would be one thing, but but a, a slight slowing off a record base is, is still not a catastrophe for us in terms of overall mining unit deliveries that we, we're expecting. And I think also we've got diversity in country risk and also commodity exposure. So you make reference to platinum, which is absolutely right. We've seen a number of closures, but a large part of the platinum mining industry in South Africa is underground, and we, we play in the main in surface mining uh, equipment so so our impact on uh, uh, through the platinum slowdown is fairly muted 
Uh, where we're still seeing some reasonably good growth prospects are in, in coal, for example, and, and that's quite a big uh, uh, part of our, uh, of our business. Is yeah. that the mainstay of your mining business, would you say? Would you go so far as to say that coal is the mainstay? Uh, I wouldn't say the mainstay, but it's, it's one of the biggest together with uh, diamonds, iron ore and, and copper although copper is outside of South Africa, and, and that was going to be my next point, is the country diversity that we have, because at the moment, Mozambique is booming in terms of the copper, um, sorry, the coal expansions in the, the Tet region in northern Mozambique. Uh, that's the Valle and, and uh, Rio Tinto projects there. And then we're also seeing pretty robust activity in the Z uh, Zambian copper belt, and also just across the border into the Katanga province of the DRC, and that's based on copper and cobalt. Mozambique, Zambia, DRC, see in terms of the the Africa story how broad are you on the continent at the moment we operate uh, throughout southern Africa it's basically from the the Congo the Democratic Republic of the Congo all the way south so we also in in places like uh, Angola um, I mean, uh, well, Angola, but also Namibia and Botswana. And some of those, Angola, for example, is more driven by infrastructure than it is by mining. There we've got about 30% of our revenues mining-based and 70% infrastructure. And again, there's still a, a real deficit of, of infrastructure in Angola on the back of, of many years of civil war that is only slowly being rebuilt. So again, the prognosis there in the medium term is pretty good. Recently, I chatted to Mark Kutafani, the CEO of Angler Gold Ashanti. Obviously, they've got a big growth story into Africa. And he was throwing forward to the fact that he basically goes on the ground in country as they expand on the African continent. He's very hands-on. Do you have a similar man management style when it comes to the African continent? Yes, uh, you know, we, we're taking our whole board up to northern Mozambique uh, just later this month. Uh, we're flying into the Tet province to have a look at our equipment working on the mine site there. And then we're down to Maputo to see a newly opened facility that, that we've done. And I, and I think it's very important to get in front of the customers, understand what the customers' needs are, so that when big strategic decisions are coming to the board, you've got a real sense of the underlying detail in order to know strategically whether these are, are the right things to be supporting and allocating capital to. Over and above the African continent, the 27 countries do you spend your life on a plane um, I probably spend 60 or 70 nights out of the country a year it's less than I was doing in 2007 when we did the major uh, restructure but it's, it's still a lot so I'm, I'm regularly in Russia in Spain uh, in the UK in the US uh, and uh, and uh, in, in Africa in different parts of Africa in terms of the teams that you deploy for your offices your Barlow world offices do you use South Africans or do you go in country and draw staff from the territories that you operate in? You know, it's a mixture, and I, and I think when one initially goes into a territory, you need to, to take some expat skills with you uh, in order to develop the, uh, the locals in terms of the knowledge and, and the, and the Bala world way of doing business. But I think it's very important in time to bring uh, what we call localization outside of South Africa. Um, because it's often the locals that have the real understanding of the way in which doing business in Russia, there's language skills, and, uh, and also often the, the real relationships with the customers uh, uh, sit in the, in, the, in the locals. So it's really a combination of the two. We're going to a short commercial break, more with Barlow World's Clive Thompson when we return. Power brokers committed to sustainability. Welcome back to Captains of Industry. Still with me in studio, Clive Thompson, the CEO of Barlow World. While we're talking about people, again, the proverbial question, what type of person do you like to surround yourself with? You know, our culture is, is a competitive one. We have results-driven people. Um, so we, we, we've got a culture that uh, where people work hard um, but are ambitious in terms of, of what we try and achieve and, um, and, but operate also in an ethical way. We've got a strong value system in the group. And uh, while we're driven by achieving uh, good results, we always want to do business in the right way. I've debated this extensively with a number of captains. Does that hard work? come at the expense of balance in one's life? 
You know, Bronwyn, I think everybody talks about uh, work-life balance, and I think everybody strives for it, but I, I think the reality it's a is, is, is that one's, what you're tell me? <laughs> one's is a little bit unbalanced, because I think the reality of, of operating, you know, a global business with the complexities and the speed at which uh, markets are moving, for one really to, to stay on top of things, one is on a treadmill, and, and there's no such thing as, as turning the speed down. You know, one's either on it or one jumps off it, but uh, uh, work-life balance, uh, one tries for, but but I think inevitably certain things get sacrificed. So you're in the camp, we go back to it, it's a myth. Is that the reality? I think that's probably the reality. <laughs> in terms of mistakes, when it comes to your staff, people who work with you, how do you manage their, their perhaps when they do make a mistake, what do, what do you do? And, and it's got enormous ramifications. Yeah. Look, I think the, the first thing is to try and understand people's strengths and weaknesses. And, and where you're putting somebody in a role that is, is new to it, you, you, you've got to make sure that you try and surround them with, with skills that's going to support their areas of weakness and, and act as a mentor yourself uh, to make sure that you're asking the right questions and, and, uh, and guiding them through areas where they, where they may need guidance. So, so there's a way in which you can, can compensate for it. But at the end of the day, our culture is also about empowering people. And, and empowering people is also allowing people to make mistakes and learning from mistakes you know there's a saying that that experience is something you get just after you most needed it and uh, in a way you've got to allow people to make mistakes in order to grow and, and, and get experience but and what if they make the same mistake twice well you know then then you've actually got to take action you know and and uh, you know you can't live with underperformance forever in a day uh, because I think people look at that and and and, and uh, subtly the message gets out that that underperformance is, is tolerated over time and and so I think you've got to be fair to individuals you've got to support them you've got to empower them you've got to allow them to make Make mistakes but at the end of the day if things are not working out you've got to be decisive in, ter in terms of making management changes how much face time do you spend with the group's clients do you get involved uh, at a personal level in terms of your customer base more on the relationship side, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be in the, in the details of, of negotiating specific tenders and More, uh, evaluating that. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is the relationship space. Do you hold those relationships? Yes. I, with, one, with customers, but secondly, with our major principles. So, for example, in the Caterpillar organization as a major principle, I would make sure from a relationship perspective that I'm close to the top people in Caterpillar. I understand their strategies, make sure we align with them, because it's only by working in partnership and alignment that we're going to maximize the benefits of that relationship and likewise with our major and significant customers uh, I would have senior level relationships there to make sure that I'm aware of, of any one failings in that relationship or, or any areas in which we can improve and understand what their, their needs are so we can proactively orientate the business to meet those needs. And what about succession planning? How deep does that run within the layers at Barlow World? We've got an extensive process which we call our ICR or Intellectual Capital Review and that's linked to our strategic planning process. So once a year as we, we do our rolling five-year plans we would conduct those for about four to five hours in the morning and immediately after that I sit with the CEOs and our group HR director and we go through our ICR process or intellectual capital review and it basically says if, if those are our strat plans for growth, what kind of skills do we need to be able to achieve our targets? Where are the ICR gaps and what's the succession planning on, on, on our key skills? So we go through that, we identify gaps, we say what are we going to do to plug gaps and where we've got people coming up for retirement or, or going to be moving to different roles, what is the succession planning in relation to those? So it's, it's an institutional part of our, of our strategic planning process annually. What does a, a typical week look for in the life of Mr. Clive Thompson? look like rather yeah look it depends on the week you know and and, and obviously in, in a time of, of a results release it's it's kind of um, announcement on sense speaking to the the financial press speaking to analysts uh, getting on a road show uh, both domestically and internationally to, to see major shareholders um, outside of of that um, it's 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 getting to, to out to our operations around the world. I mean, I chair all the divisional board meetings, but when I'm out there, I also try and meet with our principals, with our customers. I try to get to events where I can engage with our employees. So is your year planned in advance? If we were to go through your diary, you would be able to say you sewn up basically yes. for a 12-month period? At our July board meeting this year, we approved the calendar for the ensuing 12 months. So, so probably 18 months in advance, we've got our, our meeting schedule organized. Now, that would include the major board meetings and, and, th and those sort of things uh, obviously there's you know there's inevitably things that crop, crop up from time to time but but essentially a large part of it is, is structured over the six years that you've been at the helm of Barlow world 
Can you define your most challenging moment? Uh, probably two things would spring to mind. I mean, the first was coming in as the CEO and, and announcing uh, at our annual general meeting in January 2007 a fairly major restructuring of the group. Um, and of course, then you were under pressure not just to deliver on, on the day-to-day -day operations, but also to execute the restructuring. And, and you know, we, we unbundled and separately listed PPC, free world coatings. We sold for 80 million uh, pounds our laboratory business in the UK, for 60 million pounds our laser and optics business in the US, for another 65 million our freight line of truck business in the US, and, and I could go on. Um, and, and doing all of that at the same time as running the business, I think, was uh, enormously <laughs> challenging. I spent a lot of time on the plane and, uh, it was a difficult time being a new CEO. Being a young CEO, I know we chatted about this before, yes. and I put the same question to, to Brett Dawson. Yes. He's another CEO out there that took over when he was very young. Mm. Did that have any bearing on how you felt? Yes, I think inevitably, because a, a lot of uh, my direct reports were, were older than me and that had more experience in the group, and so you've obviously got to establish your credibility with them. And, uh, uh, and, and I think therefore being young is, is, um, uh, does come with its, its set of challenges. Um, so, so that certainly 2007, uh, through the restructure, was, a, was a, a difficult year. But the results were good in 2007, and up to September 2008 were also good. And then, of course, the financial crisis. And of course, we know <laughs> what's coming, the financial crisis. I mean, yes. you managed your way through that financial crisis. That must have been an enormous task. It, it was hair-raising, and, and I think particularly in our industries, because, you know, as I've often said to our people, we, we don't sell cereal or, or, or bread. You know, at the end of the day, if, if, if times are tough, you, you've still got to have your breakfast in the morning you, you might not buy that fancy new car with a holiday home or or, 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 or whatever but in, in our industry you know when the construction cycle turns or the mining cycle turns people just switch off the taps and and, and capex just gets stopped and and across uh, in our mining sector we saw 65 percent drop off in, in mining sales in in the year post september 2011 and bigger in spain 85 percent over 18 months so it was off the charts it was it was catastrophic but and did you have strength of balance sheet to support you through that period? Yes, um, we did. I mean, we maintained our A-plus credit rating throughout the crisis. We, we were put on negative outlook for a period, but we were never downgraded. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we've, as we emerged through it, we were put back on stable outlook. So I, I, I can confidently say the financial team did a good job of managing the cash, which is the most critical thing in that time frame. You get caught with a lot of in inventory, a lot of indigestion. You, you've, got to, you've got inventory coming at you from your principals. The customers are not taking it out of the door. And, um, and therefore, cash management becomes a really critical process. And of course, expense-based management. If we see global financial crisis too, are you ready? I think we're probably better placed, having, having learnt the, 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 the lessons of, of what needs to be done. We, we sort of do a trough planning process, uh, which basically says, you know, in advance, we, we, we know what we need to do uh, if, if things turn difficult. And, uh, and having done it uh, through 09 and 010, uh, I think we've got the, the model. Besides cash flow, what else is crucially important in your trough management? You know, essentially, it's, it's, um, it's, it's cash generation, it's around working capital management, so very tight control over, over receivables and, and inventory. Um, obviously, uh, your capital expenditure gets looked at very closely, and you tend to uh, defer some non-essential capex, and then cost-based management, and obviously discretionary expenditure uh, uh, you, you tend to cut back on um, and, uh, and, and tighten up on, on, on every aspect of your, of your opex, uh, if, if you like, to make sure that your cost base is, is lean. In that you do have exposure, an extensive exposure in the emerging market space, in the emerging market space rather. The political risk associated with the group, do you, does that, is that something that keeps you awake? You know, it fluctuates from time to time, and, and uh, uh, you know, Russia, there was some political uncertainty ahead of these elections uh, in different parts of Africa, you know, it varies on a country-by-country -country basis, but some are, are less stable than others. So I think it's always on the horizon, and, and the policy uncertainty that comes with political change is, is, is always a key factor for us. Because we Have so you ever turned around in a territory because of policy uncertainty? It was a go area, and then you've actually pulled back. Has that happened? 
I think Zimbabwe was a case in point, uh, but so, some of that was essentially forced uh, through nationalisation of some of our interests when you, when you go back in, in time. We held 100% uh, of some of our subsidiaries there. Now we, we're still uh, involved, but with a minority percentage. That's the only one I, I can think we've, we've actively withdrawn uh, as, a, as a consequence of, of, of political circumstances. But, but in others, you have tend to scale back your investment. I mean, if you, if you feel in, insecure about property rights and so on, it would affect your willingness to, to commit capital. Are there any territories where your willingness to commit capital has been affected because of policy uncertainty, property uncertainty? I think in the times of the civil war in, in Angola and, and Mozambique, uh, we were definitely reluctant to commit capital over those times. Uh, and uh, but, uh, but I think since that time, things have changed for the positive there, and, and we, we invest in capital at present in both of those countries. I think the, the first global financial crisis took many uh, off guard. Nobody realized the extent of the negativity that we were going to face. What are the red flags you're looking for right now in terms of what potentially could be brewing? What will be the number one flag that says, listen, the trough element must be brought into play? Look, it's, it still sits with, with Eurozone as far as I'm concerned and, and uh, the legacy of the financial crisis in terms of unsustainable uh, budget, gov uh, budget deficits in, in many of the southern European economies. Um, and, and also overextended uh, banking sectors, uh, and, and you know, Spain is, is an obvious uh, part of that. And while it's confined uh, to those economies, the knock-on effect is serious because uh, you know, if, if it did precipitate a Greek exit from the Eurozone and Spain and Portugal, it would have knock-on effects for, for French and other banks that have loaned money into those segments. The whole contagion. Element. The whole contagion. And, and, and ultimately, Europe's a big part of, of the global uh, growth, so it would, it would, it would have knock-on effects in terms of US growth, uh, Chinese growth and, and ultimately you know, South African growth as well. Are you net positive or net negative about where we're going in this next couple of years? I, I think one would have liked more decisive action uh, on the Eurozone, more quickly, more decisively, and, and, and to stabilize markets. And I think it's been a little bit drawn out. Uh, I think at the end of the day, they're moving towards making the right decisions, but, but it's because of the, the political sovereignty that exists in Europe, it's not as easy, you know, everything's a negotiation, everybody's got vested interests, and, and I think it's taking longer than people would like, and therefore the uncertainty is being more drawn out. But I think at the end of the day, we'll get to where we need to get to. Um, although I'm not saying that I'm, I'm thinking there's going to be a V-shaped rebound in, in growth. I think there's going to be relatively slow growth in Europe for a number of years, but I think we will avoid a catastrophic situation. So po possibly erring on the net positive side. Yeah, erring on the net positive, you. yes. Thanks so much for your time, Claire. We've come to the end of this week's edition of Captains of the Industry. Until next time, it's goodbye and thank you for watching. Out of the Ordinary Insights, brought to you by Investec Specialist Bank.